Got it. All right, shall we? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start our session. So this is the um, uh, Chicxulub impact and Cretaceous Paleogene boundary uh, new findings and perspectives. One, our poster session related to this is tomorrow afternoon. Also, parallel to this in the paleo section is a poster session with some related uh, research um, on the Chicxulub impact crater. Um, so after this is over at 3.40 or whatever, if you're interested in seeing some of that, that this, those posters will still be up. So our first speaker today is uh, Jay Malosh. He's talking about the mechanics of peak ring impact crater formation um, from IODP ICDP Expedition 364. Jay. Well, uh Hope you're, you'll have a good afternoon. Welcome to the Chicxulub session. And it's my, my privilege to be able to introduce this section and uh, try to tell you why uh, it's so important that we got this borehole and uh, what the wonderful results tell us. And um, so- You're on the Mac, so use the Mac keyboard. Um, oh, the white all right, keyboard, the one. yeah. Okay. And um, peak ring craters, of which Chicxulub is one, um, are a class of uh, impact craters at the large end, and so they're not really subject to experimental study. Uh, the sequence of uh, crater morphology with size was first defined by G.K. Gilbert back in the 1890s, um, and it ranges from small uh, parabolic craters, uh, like meteor crater, kind of bowl-shaped, uh, that are the smallest craters on the moon, and then it ranges up to peak ring craters, which are the classic crater form, I think. And uh, before we get uh, up to multi-ring basins, which I'm not gonna talk about today, there is another class in which the, uh, the central peak uh, changes morphology and we end up with a, a central ring of craters, of, of, of mountains, inside the crater, typically about half the diameter of the, um, the outer crater itself. Uh, we have examples of this on the moon, uh, where this progression is well marked. But we also, oh, and uh, Schrodinger Crater on the moon is the classic example. Uh, you know, it's uh, very photogenic. It's on, on the left-hand edge uh, with an image. You can see the, the rings. It's about 340 kilometers in diameter. Uh, the topography shows a nearly flat floor with a ring, an incomplete ring of mountains. And then the radial elevation profile is kind of an average profile that shows the, the peak ring at about half the diameter of the crater rim. Now, the craters of this kind are, I mean, it's, it's a, a normal morphology of large craters to see this. We see um, at different diameters, we see the same kind of progression of simple craters to peak, uh, to central peak to peak ring on Mercury on the upper left, on Mars on the uh, lower part of the screen, and on Venus um, at uh, the, the upper right. Um, the diameter of onset depends upon gravity. Uh, the onset diameters of Mercury and Mars are about uh, twice, uh, I'm sorry, half the diameter of the Moon. And uh, Venus, the onset diameter is about the same as what we think it is on Earth. Unfortunately, there are not very many examples on Earth. Uh, so uh, this is a comparison between Schrodinger. Uh, this is a, an image from uh, David Kring who overlaid Grail gravity on it and um, it makes a nice transition to Chicxulub because Chicxulub was only first recognized by gravity field and that's the right hand uh, form of uh, uh, image shows the gravity field. It's not quite a one-to-one -one comparison because the grail gravity on the left is just the, uh, the vertical acceleration of gravity. On the right, what you're, you're seeing is the gravity gradient, but it still points up the fact that uh, you can see these rings in gravity field, and that's a good way to investigate the craters. Unfortunately, gravity, uh, although it sees deep, uh, doesn't see details, and it doesn't re you know, reveal the depth. And so we're still um, arguing, or have been arguing, about the nature of the peak rings. Now, Jim Head, for many years, has evolved um, a model that he calls the nested melt crater model for um, peak ring formation, in which he attributes the uh, ring to, um, or, or uh, locates that at a boundary between a melt pocket that he believes, uh, at least in 2010, believed formed in the bottom of the crater, and, um, and, the, um, and the unmelted shock material, shown in green on this slide, 
on the left-hand side of the slide, what he argued is that after uplift, the uh, material right between the melt pocket and the um, unshocked material or lightly shocked material would be the peak ring. So that tells us, first of all, that um, in terms of the origin of the material in the peak ring, it should come from higher up in the crust, if not uh, actually at the surface itself, and it should represent material that is shocked to pressures just short of melting. Uh, and we'll see how that uh, uh, idea plays out. Uh, he revised that slightly in uh, 2016 uh, and added a number of different uh, uh, components to the model. Uh, this is out of a review paper in 2016, just before the Chicxulub drilling came in. And you can see, though, the, the same thing. The peak ring comes from close to the, the melt, unmelted region transition through the excavation of the crater, the opening, the collapse. Uh, all that ends up with the peak ring. Now, uh, even earlier than that, uh, uh, Gareth Collins, Joe Morgan, uh, Mike Warner, and I proposed a model we call dynamic collapse. The idea there is that the peak ring actually evolves from a central peak that came up well beyond the point that we actually see central peak craters, that the central peak then collapsed. It, uh, in collapsing, sent a flood of material uh, radially outward, and that met a much of material flowing radially inward, and that collision then raised a, a ring. Um, at that time, we were somewhat non-quantitative about it, but uh, things have happened since to give us a much more quantitative view of that model. Now, the, one of the uh, reasons we did the IODP 364 drilling was uh, to test these models and to understand where it is that peak rings come from. So here's the, the final uh, location of the borehole. This is from uh, a 2012 summary in which we, at that time, planned to have two holes. Well, that doesn't always work out. Money is finite. But uh, in the end, we got one hole. But what a success. It was a, a tremendous success. We got great core recovery. Other people will tell you about that. But it was a, a fantastic success um, uh, as a result of this effort. Uh, the results are, uh, first of all, in terms of the, the origin, or uh, focusing on the origin of peak rings, the, the rocks uh, in the uh, core hole coming out from the crater, or the, the peak ring, um, are granitic, they're mid-crustal, uh, and they were shocked to pressures of uh, 10 to about 33 GPA. Here's uh, some shock quartz uh, in the uh, you know, 50 micron scale to uh, give an idea of that, yes, there was shock. Um, and uh, the melt cavity model predicts that the rock should have originated from close to the surface and be shocked to 60 GPA. Um, X that out, I think. I hope that's the end of the nested crater model. Um, the dynamic <laughs> collapse model uh, that predicts that the rocks should be mid-crustal and shocked to made, uh, more than 10 GPA, and that agrees with the core, of, uh, with what's been found. And the next talk will give you more detail on the core. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the mechanism. This is from the 2017 science paper by Joe Morgan. Um, and um, there are a series of stills here that show um, the uh, high color highlighted region with the colors indicating shock level, um, indicate the material that will eventually end up in the peak ring. You can see it goes through a, a lot of uh, dynamic motion during the impact. It's sheared out along the crater wall. Um, when it collapses, it comes back, it, it, it forms the base of the central peak. The central peak collapses and pushes this material out over the uh, crustal rocks that have been um, you know, bowed down as the crater collapsed. It overrides those, something that we see in the seismic, uh, seismic reflection signals, and ends up uh, here at the peak ring where it was uh, accessible to drilling. And the next uh, image I want to show is uh, a dynamic um, simulation of that. This is a, um, a ISAIL simulation in axial symmetry that, uh, that Gareth Collins uh, sent uh, to share with everybody today. And you can see, again, this, this area um, of uh, material that became the peak ring. The, the explosions that you're seeing on the surface might be a problem with the numerical model. 
and maybe not, because uh, what we're doing in this simulation is we actually have calcite in here, the, the, the limestone rocks in the target, and what we're seeing is the, um, at the high temperature and low pressure, uh, we're seeing the calcite uh, degas, and some of these bubbles are actually the, the result of the equation state saying, oops, I'm, I'm hot, I'm in vapor phase, and um, I've made a lot of vapor that needs to escape. The collapse itself, um, the, the fluid-like flow, is not something that's natural for rocks to do. Uh, if I uh, have a, a, a bunch of rock, it has friction, even if it doesn't have strength, even though it's been broken, and um, it will stand at angles of 30 degrees or so, and you could conceivably have a crater uh, 100 kilometers in diameter and 30 kilometers deep, and according to standard rock mechanics, that would be stable and it, we could have a pit 30 kilometers deep where the Chicxulub crater actually formed. That doesn't happen. Uh, ev all the evidence is that these craters collapse right away. And uh, the mechanism that I've proposed uh, some time ago to explain this, uh, to explain the fact that you know, even craters 15 kilometers diameter on the moon are, are collapsing, is something that I called acoustic fluidization. I might better call it vibrational fluidization. The idea is that um, you know, shortly after the impact, there are wild pressure fluctuations. This is pressure versus time. As the pressure fluctuates, you get to low pressures. And even with Coulomb friction present, uh, at times during the shaking, sliding can occur, and the mass can creep forward in a fluid-like fashion. I can demonstrate this and, and have in the laboratory at other AGU talks. Uh, we simplified it for the uh, calculation in what the Russians call the block models. Uh, Russians like block models, and uh, my colleague Boris Ivanov um, was an example of that. Uh, his idea of we have a block of, of, of rock, for example, with broken rocks uh, adjacent to it. If the pressures fluctuate on top like this, as the, we get to the low pressure part of the fluctuation, sliding can occur and motion can occur at uh, very large, low stress levels. So to, to summarize all of this, uh, I'll just leave you with the, um, another simulation with the, the full 3D restored. This will run um, uh, in a loop. But the bottom line is that dynamic collapse models facilitated by a, a transient strength loss uh, that we parameterized by acoustic fluidization. Um, if you don't like acu acoustic fluidization, you need to come up with some other model for greatly re weakening the model, uh, the, the strength around the, the crater. But at any rate, in the, the strength reduction model, in addition to the um, hydrodynamic models, which successfully capture all the, the physics of uh, material transport, uh, energy conservation, uh, equations of state, th those are all in there. Uh, we've made many simulations of um, you know, uh, events for which we actually know the answer and uh, the code successfully reproduces that. So these hydrocodes are really a way of putting all the physics together in a consistent way and uh, seeing if that story is consistent with uh, the observation. And in the case of the borehole and in the case of the results that we got, it looks like um, the um, uh, dynamic collapse model is in complete agreement with the observations. So thank you. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Yes, uh, okay, great. Um, as you know, there are um, the ice satellites, these things we call central pit craters, where the, 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 the ring is much smaller in proportion to the crater. Could a dynamic collapse model work in that environment, or is it size differential? I, yeah, I, I think central pit craters are a slight variation on that, actually, they might be closer to the nested crater model, um, that the, um, the rocks in, rocks, the ice in the center of the central pit craters is relatively warm. I think it melts, and that what we're looking at is a central, what would be a central peak, except it was hot enough that it melted and it drained into the fractures below. Uh, Veronica Bray and I have a, a paper that's now four or five years old uh, that explores that, that scenario in some detail. And I think we can explore the central pit craters, not only on the outer satellites, but also uh, on Mars. Uh, 
we see a number of central pit craters that I think are probably also due to this melt drainage process. What happened to the projectile? Uh, in the case of uh, Chicxulub, the projectile struck at high enough speed, it was completely vaporized. It's actually in the simulation, um, except that uh, in order not to distract uh, from the crater, we have chosen to delete anything that is low in density. So there's some funny things that you may see going on at the surface because we delete low density stuff. But the, the projectile itself vaporizes, leaves the target area, um, I think condenses, and uh, when it condenses, it forms these you know, uh, 20, 200 micron size beads that we find distributed over our entire planet. Uh, in the simulations, they go out at, uh, as, well, at Earth escape velocity and below. And uh, those that uh, are less than Earth escape velocity come back over typically a period of a few hours. And uh, that is the deposit, the so-called magic layer or fireball layer that we see three millimeters thick or so distributed over the entire Earth. Okay, so we need to move on. Okay, so the next talk is being given by Gail Christensen. She's going to tell us about the physical properties. Thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the physical properties that uh, we drilled at the Chicxulub Crater uh, Peak Ring during uh, Expedition 364. So just to locate us, uh, we saw a different version of this in uh, Jay Malash's talk. Uh, what we're plotting here in color is the gravity field over the Chicxulub Crater. And the... Um, peak ring of the crater we've identified based on this grid of seismic reflection profiles to be this uh, low gravity feature here. Um, and uh, the low gravity would uh, also be associated with low densities. Uh, also what I plot here are some of the onshore wells which also um, have recovered some of the um, impact crater rocks. So if we look at a seismic reflection section through the peak ring, uh, this is approximately where we drilled. You can see the peak ring ex itself uh, stands several hundred meters above the surrounding crater floor. Uh, the velocity model shown below for the peak ring, if you look here at the contours, you can see the contours dip down beneath the peak ring, which uh, shows that these are lower velocities compared to the surrounding adjacent rocks. Uh, prior to drilling, uh, the interpretation was that these lowered velocities were associated with uh, highly fractured and brecciated basement rocks. If we look at some high resolution velocity models over the crater, um, uh, so here's the peak ring. And what I want you to focus on is this light blue layer that you see on all these profiles. If we look down here at the velocity, you can see that uh, the light blue is lower velocity than the green. So these, um, this layer of light blue has green above and below, so it's a low velocity layer right at the top of the peak ring. It's about 100 to 200 meters thick. And um, prior to drilling, this was interpreted by uh, Morgan et al. as um, uh, being associated with highly porous impact breaches. And what's exciting about this is that if the drilling confirms that the impact breaches are these, is a low velocity layer, then we can use these high uh, high resolution velocity models to map the uh, impact breccia throughout the crater. Okay, so what did we recover? Uh, on the left is the simplified lithology through the hole. So at the top, we, we didn't start drilling to, uh, until about a depth of about 500 meters start uh, getting the core. So at the top, we uh, re recovered paleogene sedimentary rock, such as this limestone show here. Then we got into a 104 meter thick layer of suevite. So that's the melt-rich impact breccia. Then we uh, got a thin layer, about 25 meters thick, of impact melt rock. And then uh, down at the bottom, we got uh, fractured granitoid throughout the, the whole rest of the uh, hole, uh, interspersed with some dikes. If you focus on the suevite layer, what you can see is that uh, the suevite changes in character as we get deeper, uh, and especially this class size. So you notice this upper suevite has really tiny class, they get bigger, and here's a very large class near the bottom of the suevite. 
So what kind of physical property measurements did we make? So we made them on uh, several scales, ranging from centimeters to meters. Uh, on the left is shown um, uh, some measurements we made on discrete samples. So these are little plugs that were six centimeter cube, uh, made at one meter spacing throughout the core. And on these, we were able to measure uh, P wave velocity, density, and porosity. At a similar scale, uh, but more continuously, we used a multi-sensor core logger, shown here. So we did this out on the platform. And along this track, we'd run each section of the core. And as it went by, it, we would measure various uh, measurements, such as uh, bulk density, resistivity, natural gamma radiation, and magnetic susceptibility. So uh, today, I'm just going to present the, the density. And finally, in, in the downhole, uh, we put a number of tools, and in particular, we measured sonic P wave velocity, which I'll present, and we also did a vertical seismic profile. So this would be at the larger scale uh, uh, in terms of meters, whereas uh, compared to the centimeter scale here. So let's look at the results. So here I'm just focusing on the upper part of the hole from the sedimentary rock to the upper granite. Uh, on this column, I'm plotting velocity. So these are uh, three different types of velocity. So we have the little samples are shown in the blue circles. Uh, the red squiggle here is showing the uh, P wave velocity from logging. And you might not be able to see, uh, there's a black line that shows the vertical seismic profile. But all of these um, are kind of overlap each other, just showing the consistency of measurements at these different scales. Right at the top of the swayvite, there's quite a large change. If you look at this, especially shown in this red line here, you can see the high velocities to low velocities. So there's a sharp boundary at the top of the swayvite in the velocity field. Um, in the next column, I'm showing the porosity. These are from the little sample measurements. Uh, in the sediment, the porosity decreases with depth, as we'd expect as um, uh, you close the cracks with increasing pressure. But again, a sharp change at the top of the swayvite to much higher porosities. Uh, the density, uh, this is from the uh, multi-sensor core logger as well as the little sample measurements. Uh, we have increasing density throughout the sediment and then this uh, paleogene sedimentary rock and then a sharp change at the swayvite. So all three of these show a sharp change uh, at the swayvite, uh, lower velocities, lower densities, higher porosity. Uh, you can see down here, as you get deeper, uh, there's much more variability in the measurements, and that's where the class size gets larger. As we get to the base of the swayvite and into the melt rock, you can see the, the lower swayvite and the melt rock have similar properties. And what we think this means is that um, as soon as you start getting some melt rock, the measurements are really picking up on the melt class, so they have similar properties. So let's move down to the granite. And what we see in the granite uh, is that um, compared to normal granite, everything is quite unusual. So uh, typical granite will have velocities of you know, 5,400 to 6,000 meters per second. We are getting 4,000, 4,000 to 4,200. Uh, similarly, densities, you'd expect densities 2.62 to 2.67. Uh, we're getting uh, about 2.4. And the porosities, Normally you get processes less than 1%, and we're getting 8 to 13%. So very unusual uh, properties, uh, significantly different than normal granites. And uh, again, these velocity and density values are consistent across scales ranging from centimeter to meters. Uh, the onshore wells, uh, what we see is that the swayvite on the onshore wells um, have similar velocity, porosity, and density values to what we measure uh, uh, in the peak ring. Um, the impact melt rock, we only have one measurement from an onshore well, and it has a considerably higher velocity and density value. So what kind of interpretation uh, can we make of our properties? So what we see in the, the swayvite and the uh, impact melt rock, we think these uh, low velocity, low density, and high porosity values are associated with uh, alteration products. So uh, we were able to uh, identify um, water-rich, high-porosity phyllosilicates, clay minerals, and zeolites. Here's a, an image of, of some of those uh, from our uh, report. Um, so these, uh, these alteration products will uh, change the physical properties in the, in the manner that we see.
Uh, as we get deeper into the granite, uh, the, 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 compared to regular granite, uh, we have these low velocities, low densities, high porosities. And we associate these to the, lar the large amount of fracturing that we're seeing, uh, as well as the highly shocked materials. So the, the highly shocked and damaged lithologies are just pervasive throughout the peak ring and will change all the physical properties. Okay, so now we've ground truth what we saw at the drill site. What can we, uh, can we move away from there and tell something about the processes going on in the crater? So what I'm showing here are some new uh, high resolution velocity models across the crater. So um, this top image goes from the annular trough across the peak ring into the central basin. The bottom image goes from, uh, from left to right, goes from near the crater rim, the annular trough uh, onto the peak ring. Uh, and what I want you to kind of focus on is, uh, again, this light blue layer, which hopefully you can see, especially on this one. Uh, so as we saw from the drilling, the, the suavites are indeed associated with a low velocity layer. So we think this uh, light blue layer that you can map across is, is that suavite layer. Uh, and then also I want you to look here, this kind of yellow red material. Uh, we think that could be the impact melt rock. So in the drilling, the impact melt rock uh, was, was quite different from that one sample that we had onshore. So the, the velocities onshore are closer to what we're seeing out here. And you can, might be able to see um, there's a low frequency reflector on top and we think that's also associated with the melt sheet. So let's look at an interpretation. So this is the line that goes um, into the central basin. So on the top and, and bottom, the purple is the uh, suavite layer. The bottom is the seismic uh, for that uh, same velocity model. And uh, what you can see is there's, a, there's topography within the suavite, so a lot of thickness variations. I especially want you to focus on these things right here. So you can see them down here. So you get these, uh, so in the seismic, there's these little peaks and they're associated with the low velocity. So we think those are you know, changes in the suavite thickness. Uh, this one is especially large. Uh, we're not quite sure if that's suavite, uh, but it seems to have the same properties as elsewhere. And underneath in red is where we think the melt sheet is. So now we're getting into speculation, but uh, what we think is perhaps uh, we know that there's a hydrothermal system that was set up, so perhaps this is uh, indicating some upflow. So uh, all these little peaks that we see are showing some upflow, and here we're kind of at the edge of where we map this melt sheet, and we have this really large one. So you can imagine at the edge might be where you have the largest upflow. So perhaps that's what's happening. Uh, we also see uh, in the annular trough what could be a melt sheet, um, but you don't see the topography, but this, we're just getting the little edge of it here. Uh, and the only other thing uh, I want you to see here is that um, if you're interested in uh, what happens after the impact in the sediment, the Paleogene sediment, what we can see is that uh, it's definitely an expanded section as you move away from the peak ring. So at the peak ring, we just got a, a little tiny bit. If you were able to drill uh, in the central basin or the annular trough, you get a thicker section. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the, the profile that goes through the annular trough. Um, and here you can see the suavite is just a nice, pretty much constant thickness, and you can map it even onto where we're approaching the crater rim. Um, and here is where, you know, this could be the melt sheet beneath it. We're not really sure what's in between these two, between the suavite and the melt sheet. Um, that's something uh, we're still thinking about, but maybe it's suavite with a higher percentage of impact melt rock. We're not, we're not really sure. Okay, so what are the implications? Well, so the suavite, it's associated, um, you know, with this low velocity zone. We can uh, map it across from the peak ring into the annular trough and central basin. We can uh, make measurements on the onshore well. It's all very consistent. So if this is caused, if, if the physical properties are caused by alteration, this su suggests that a hydrothermal system was widespread if we're, if we're seeing the same uh, physical properties throughout the crater. And then uh, the uplifted granite peak ring rocks, uh, Jay talked a lot about this in the, in the last talk, 
Uh, we, we think these represent some of the most shocked and damaged rocks in the impact basin. Uh, they have very unusual physical properties compared to uh, normal granites. Um, and then when we look at these, FW, these uh, high resolution velocity models, they show a lot of um, topography in the suavite that might be associated with upflow from a hydrothermal system. And the similar features are not present in the annular trough. Uh, so this suggests maybe a less vigorous hydrothermal system in the annular trough compared to the central basin. And our future work, right now we just have these, these two profiles with the high resolution velocities. So our future work will focus on obtaining these throughout the crater to see whether it's systematic throughout the whole annular trough and central basin, these differences. Thank you. So we've got time for one question, I think. Yes, can you uh, speak more to the question of where the crustal section of the deep green rocks came from, that what Jay was talking about? Oh, can I tell from where they came from? Mid-level, upper level. Ten kilometers. Hmm? <laughs> Joe says ten kilometers. <laughs> it's, it's actually based on the models, right? That's that depth level. Based on the numerical models? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what we can say is that, yeah. Um, not sure what else. Yeah. That's all we have. Yeah, so it's, that's just based on the numerical models. Yeah. So on the, it's all the same model, but on um, Jay showed the Paris model, yeah, so I was wondering, same question, what did you get for that basement unit that didn't get so disturbed? And that was about twice as deep as, as the sewer bikes, so maybe 20 km. Yeah, I don't know, Jay, if you want to. Well, those simulations were one-to-one -one vertical and horizontal scale. Uh, so there's no vertical exaggeration. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, what we do know from other geophysical data is that down at the base of the crust, which is about 35 kilometers, you still see some uplift. So we can map that. It's about a kilometer of uplift. Okay, we should uh, probably move on. Our next talk. Yep, our next talk is uh, Oriel Ray uh, on magnitude and orientation of stress during shock metamorphism, understanding peak ring formation by combining observations and models. Okay, um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm gonna be talking today about some more results from Expedition 364, um, where as people who've been hearing Jay and Gail talk, one of the primary goals was to understand and to test models of peak ring formation in large impact craters. Um, so specifically here, I'm gonna be talking about observations of shock deformation within the Chicxulub peak ring, and then contextualizing that within numerical simulations of uh, the cratering event. Okay, but before I begin, um, I need to thank many people, all of the expedition scientists, my supervisors, and my other collaborators, as well as all of the funding bodies that have enabled my research and also the expedition itself. Um, I don't have time to go through each and every one of them. Um, now, oh, yeah, so uh, as we've already talked about, um, one of the primary goals of this expedition was to understand models of peak ring formation. Um, so prior to drilling, seismic images and numerical models had indicated that peak rings are created by the formation of an over-heightened central uplift. And yeah. Yeah. Um, we've seen this simulation before, but we have an over-heightened central uplift which comes up and then collapses outwards to form a peak ring. Um, Nonetheless, this model needs to be tested. So, um, in, ooh, let's go back. Here's the keyboard, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in April, May 2016, the IDP drilled into the Chicxulub Peak Ring and there was about 130 meters of uh, allochthonous impact ites on top of this 580 meter section of granitic basement rocks. Um, so here I'm gonna be presenting some observations of the shock-related deformation, which is gonna be constraining both the magnitude and the orientation of shock through the material, um, which will hopefully give some insights into shock processes, but also the process of crater modification. Okay, 
So before I do that, though, I just need to quickly go over some examples of shock deformation. Here I'm showing three examples of some shock deformation that we saw within the core. Um, on the left-hand side, we have some planar fractures. There are also some planar deformation features. Here are some planar deformation features, um, and here are some feather features. And they are important and quite distinct. So planar fractures are open. They're several microns wide, and they have spacings of tens to hundreds of microns. Planar deformation features are glassy lamellae that are crystallographically oriented, and experimental results have shown that that's consistent with uh, what shock pressure that material has then gone to. And then finally, feather features, which are also open fractures, but they're much shorter, and they occur as single sets on planar fractures, and uh, they are typically 10 to 100 microns in length. Um, now, the important thing about these is that feather features have been found experimentally to be linked to the orientation of principal stress during shock. So the orientation of the feather feature lamellae should point in the direction of the sigma 1 direction, or the longitudinal stress during shock. Okay. Uh, additionally, these individual features have been associated with specific times during the shock pulse. So here I'm showing the shock pulse with time progressing from the left to the right. And planar fractures start forming when uh, the shock wave exceeds the Hugonio elastic limit of the material. So that occurs during this earlier stage, just after the elastic precursor, which happens down here. Then we start going up to where we have plastic deformation. So we form these planar fractures. As we come up towards the uh, plateau of shock pressure, we start forming planar deformation features, which are sensitive to the exact height at which this shock pulse reaches. And then feather features form at some time later. Uh, this can be seen because feather features will always cross-cut uh, planar deformation features. Okay, so if you spend some time in a basement with a universal stage, you can measure the orientation of planar deformation features. Uh, and if you do that, you can then calibrate, by using the experimental results, what shock pressure the rocks experienced. So by looking at uh, 1,232 indexed planar deformation sets uh, in 574 grains, Basically, well, I've had to come to the conclusion that more or less everything is shocked about 15 gigapascals all the way throughout the core and throughout the granitic rocks. Um, that's plus or minus about six gigapascals. Uh, okay, moving swiftly on to some more universal stage measurements. Thankfully, I didn't do these ones. Uh, these were done by Martin Schleiblich of the feather feature orientations. Now, uh, the orientations that have been measured um, indicate that the sigma-1 orientation in the present-day orientation of the core is vertical. So what this means is that the orientation at which the shock wave is going through these walks uh, in the current orientation is vertical at the moment. Um, now, it's also noticeable, and thankfully Gale's talk came before mine, that the rocks that we recovered, the granitic rocks, are highly porous. Okay, and actually, when you look at these under the SEM, you can see that most of this porosity is controlled by the subgrain scale fracturing of the rocks. Um, the thing that's also apparent is that the quartz uh, grains within the granite are actually dominating the porosity. They have about twice as much porosity as the rest of the material. So all of this material is pervasively fractured, and it has a, a baseline porosity of about 8%, and then there's also these cataclastic veins which add extra porosity that take it up to the... 10, 11% that we saw. Um, now, uh, a master's student who I've been working with has been analyzing the orientations of this uh, porosity. Um, basically, what we do is we threshold the porosity, and then we're able to work out what the orientations are. And the orientations are plotted on the right-hand side. And in this particular whole thin section, we can see that the dominant orientation, we have two dominant orientations. One's vertical, one's vaguely horizontal. Um, yeah, this is vertically along the axis of the core, just to make it clear for all these next plots I'm going to show. And obviously you can show this for one individual thin section, but in order to understand a picture of the whole core, you need to understand lots throughout. So here's 10 thin sections where we've got whole, SE, uh, whole thin section SEM scans. And what this indicates is all of, most of them have uh, a dominant vertical orientation of fractures, and then some of them there's a subordinate uh, sub-horizontal orientation of fractures. Um, and I'll come back to this later. Um, addition, oh, uh, I should say here that um, now planar fractures do form along crystallographically oriented planes, but the fact that the orientations of the fractures 
is consistent across many grains all within exactly the same thin section, despite the fact that those individual grains are randomly oriented, indicates that the orientation of planar fractures may not necessarily be crystallographically controlled in the same way that planar deformation features are. It may not necessarily be shock pressure, and instead it might be the conditions of deviatoric stress that are causing uh, fractures to form in the orientations that they do. Okay? In addition, when we use uh, electron backscatter diffraction, which is a, an SEM technique, which maps the orientation of the crystal structure, um, we can see that along most of the fractures, we can see crystal plastic deformation. What I'm plotting here is a map of the local misorientation, which is essentially the angular difference between each pixel and its surrounding eight pixels from zero to 10 degrees, where red is 10 degrees. Um, now what you can see here is that there's a lot of crystal plastic deformation associated against the fractures, at the fracture terminations, and on sub-parallel features to the fractures which go along the crystal itself. So this reinforces the idea that these planar fractures are forming as a result of the local shear stress conditions. So now I'm going to try and place that deformation within uh, the context of uh, the numerical simulations. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm using the ICL shock physics code. Uh, where we use a 14 kilometer diameter impactor traveling at 15 kilometers a second into a three layer target of uh, calcite sediments, granitic basement uh, crust, and also uh, dunite mantle. And hopefully my videos will work. So uh, it's important to note that we use a uh, rock strength model which is supplemented by the block model implementation of acoustic fluidization. Um, and within the simulation, we embed Lagrangian tracer particles. Now, these tracer particles follow an individual package of material as you move through the simulation, and this allows us to track the orientation of stress through the peak ring material as it moves around through the simulation. Okay, so as I've said already, we can look at the shock pressures that the rock has experienced, but we also need to look at the deviatoric part of the stress. Um, so at the top left, I'm just going to be plotting just the earliest stages of the, uh, of the shock wave passing into the material. And what you're seeing there is a plot of the pressure as we go into the material. The three other plots are actually plotting the is going to be plotting information about the deviatoric stress conditions. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just plotting at the top right a cross section through the Lame stress ellipsoid, which is showing what the orientation of the sigma 1, the maximum compressive stress, and also the orientation of sigma three, the minimum compressive stress. Um, at the bottom left, we'll just be showing the magnitudes of the sigma one, two, and three um, uh, principal stresses. Sigma two during shock is in fact always in the hoop direction, so it's always into and out of the, the screen that you're looking at. And then finally, I'll be plotting the pressure in blue on the bottom right, as well as the maximum resolvable shear stress. Okay, now, uh, oh. So this actually may all be a little bit too much information, but we're going to go through this twice over, uh, just so that we go through it. What we can see here is we have the shock pulse, which you can see here. These are the orientations of the deviatoric principal stresses, these are the magnitudes rather, where the red is the sigma 1, it's compressive and it comes up to about, uh, it's 2.5 gigapascals greater than the pressure. The minimum uh, principal deviatoric stress is about, gets to about minus 2.5 gigapascals less than the pressure at the time after shock, but this is associated with the rarefaction wave, the wave that releases pressure from the material. Um, the point being here is that we can actually break down the shock wave into specific uh, time steps, and what we're going to do now is we're going to try and see if we can relate the observations that we saw earlier about the shock deformation to the orientations of stress that we can model here. Okay, so. The first stage, which is after the elastic precursor arrives, which is this little tiny blue lump there on this shock pulse, this is where we would think that planar fractures would form during the very earlier stages. And at this point, the maximum principal compressive stress is dipping into the crater at uh, 18 degrees. Okay? And what we would expect is that if these are shear related fractures, they will be forming at 45 degrees to the maximum principal compressive stress. Um, this is particularly the case during the high pressure regime. It's not the case in the low pressure state. Um, so what this means is that we're going to have uh, fracture orientations at 63 degrees, dipping inwards, and at uh, 27 degrees, dipping outwards. Um, 
Now, the next stage in this process is we're going to hit the peak shock conditions, and at the peak shock conditions, we're going to be forming those planar deformation features. This particular tracer particle goes to 27 gigapascals, um, but across the entire peak ring, it would actually be fairer to say that the rocks go between about 15 and 25 gigapascals on average. Um, now, in the final stage, where we have, after the point of peak shock conditions, we have the peak shear stress conditions. And this is where we would think that feather features would form, which indicate an orientation of the principal compressive stress. But the point about this is that the orientation of the principal compressive stress has rotated by about 50 degrees from where it was when the planar fractures were forming. So at this time, the maximum principal compressive stress is dipping at 30 degrees outwards from the crater. And this means that the feather feature lamellae are also going to be pointing at 30 degrees outwards. Um, now you'll notice, of course, that uh, these orientations are not consistent with what we've seen in observations, but this is because I've not yet gone into how the crater is modified by later deformation. So what I'm plotting here on the right-hand side is the orientations that I was talking about. This is the 30-degree uh, feather feature orientation dipping outwards, and then these are the two orientations in blue of the planar fracture sets. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow the rotational history of the material in the simulation and see how that compares to the observations. So here we have crater, the transit cavity forms, it then collapses downwards, forms into the uh, central peak, which then collapses outwards. What we end up with, and in a second it will flash up roughly where the observations plot, is we have a vertical orientation of fractures, a sub-horizontal orientation of fractures, and also we end up with the feather features in a vertical orientation, which is where they are in the present day. So what I've hopefully managed to demonstrate to you is that there is a remarkable consistency between all three of these different types of shock-related deformation. Um, in fact, so remarkable that it really does show that it is very likely that this dynamic collapse model does operate. But there's actually something a bit, maybe a bit more, um, uh, something to, an important point that this raises is that deviatoric stress conditions during shock and during cratering are actually very important. They can be observed and they can also be modeled. So this makes for important implications regarding the anisotropy of permeability in craters, as well as looking at um, uh, the history of deformation in shocked rocks. And there I'll leave it. Okay, so I don't we haven't got time for questions, but we do have a, a missed presentation later, so we might be able to ask questions during that point to Oriel. I'll go, yeah. Um, so the next talk's by David Kring. He's going to be talking about the hydrothermal system at the crater. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Joe. Um, all right. Uh, it's an expedition. It's a team project. And you can see I have a lot of co-authors, and I do thank all of them for their work over the past year, and actually the past 10 years as we got this expedition uh, launched. Okay, uh, this is a diagram uh, that you've seen before. This is Yucatan Peninsula. This is an outline of, um, of the circle that roughly represents the dimensions of this crater, and this is the location of the Expedition 364 borehole. This is a list of some of the key objectives uh, for this particular project, and I'm going to focus on the two highlighted in yellow today. Uh, one is to test models of impact-generated hydrothermal activity, and two is to evaluate the habitability of the hydrothermal system. Okay, so uh, let's go back in history just a little bit. Uh, building on models developed for Sudbury and several Mars craters, uh, one of my uh, PhD students, Oleg Abramov, constructed a model of the Chicxulub hydrothermal system. Uh, this is one of the time steps uh, for that system about 4,000 years after the impact event. And I've plotted on here uh, two different uh, regimes. One, this is simply the thermal uh, state of the uh, crater. This is the center of the crater. This is the peak ring. This is the rim. And these are temperature contours. This is 1,200 degrees, uh, 900, 600, uh, 300, 200, 100, and so on. Uh, on this side is the uh, result of Oleg's hydrotherm calculation showing the circulation of water uh, in blue and where steam was actually produced. 
Uh, and one of the takeaways here is that A, we had a hydrothermal system, and B, the most intense part of that hydrothermal system was in the peak ring uh, adjacent to the uh, impact melt sheet in the center of the crater. Uh, this is that same model 20,000 uh, years after the impact event. You can see the uh, uh, melt sheet is starting to cool. There's migration of the hydrothermal system uh, inwards. Uh, the same at 200,000 years, and after about 2 million years, uh, the hydrothermal uh, system is come to a stop according to this model. Um, okay, so we wanted to test this model. Uh, this is where the uh, borehole was sunk on the outer edge of the uh, peak ring, and so the question that we had, would we, would we see hydrothermal alteration in that core? And moreover, if we did see hydrothermal alteration, would we see temperatures that were approximately 300 degrees C? So now let's look at uh, the evidence. Okay, so I want to begin with high evidence of high temperature alteration. Uh, this is um, uh, one of the granites from deep within uh, the, the peak ring. Uh, this is an 83 millimeter uh, wide scan of the core. Here's a two, two centimeter scale bar uh, uh, so that you can get the dimensions of this. And throughout this granite, there are centimeter sized cavities uh, where uh, high temperature metasomatic uh, fluids have dissolved the quartz uh, from the granite. And this is a process that is, uh, normally occurs at 300 to 400 degrees C in a hydrothermal uh, system. Uh, the rock, as you've seen in other talks, is cross cut by a large number of fractures and faults. Uh, these fractures are oftentimes filled with hydrothermal mi minerals. Here you can see uh, epidote and here's some uh, quartz. Uh, you can also see that there is a differential metasomatic alteration of the feldspar in the granites uh, in response to the fluids uh, that have been carried through uh, these faults and open uh, fractures. Uh, the granite is also cross-cut by cataclastic uh, veins, which are another uh, fluid pathway. Uh, also, I want you to note that the quartz in some sections of the granite uh, is lavender colored, so it is actually uh, been uh, chemically altered with uh, trace elements. Now let's take a closer up look. This is a backscatter electron image. Uh, this is a 0.2 uh, millimeter scale bar. If I can read that from afar, that looks right. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to show in this uh, diagram. First, there are these metasomatic fronts that we're moving through the impact melt. This is the impact melt. It's composed of uh, mic microcrystalline uh, uh, assemblage of feldspar and uh, high calcium pyroxene. Uh, you have these metasomatic fronts moving through um, the impact uh, melt, and also uh, fluids are sometimes preferentially uh, uh, concentrated along uh, fractures, so the alteration is enhanced in those uh, regions. Moreover, uh, the impact melt entrained uh, shock quartz crystals, which in this area of the impact melt have been completely or nearly completely dissolved. So we have quartz dissolution again and subsequent replacement by calcite. So this is calcite. Here is relic quartz that survived the dissolution and where it was dissolved, it's again been replaced uh, by uh, calcite. Uh, we also have a potassium feldspar and um, uh, albite veins running through the granite. Again, this is the type of feature that we see at high temperature metasomatic conditions of roughly 350 degrees. We have pervasive alteration at much lower temperatures. Uh, uh, commonly that's seen by replacement of uh, impact glasses by a variety of magnesium, iron, and sodium potassium sheet silicates. Uh, here, um, again, you see these melt fragments. Here, by the way, is uh, an optical uh, view. Uh, with cross polars, and this is simply a plain uh, light view. Uh, these are saponite like and montmorillonite like smec type root minerals. That's a big uh, a group of words uh, to indicate it's a mess uh, with some, uh, significant chemical zoning and a variety of, of water abundances. I'm going to skip through this because I think I'm running just a little bit short on time. There are a number of vesicles within the impact melt. I want to show you several examples. Uh, this is a nice vesicle within, again, that nice uh, microcrystalline impact melt. In this case, it's being filled with uh, iron sulfide. There's also magnetite, both nickel bearing uh, and titanium magnetite uh, throughout uh, the impact uh, melt. Uh, here's another example of one of those vesicles. In this case, uh, the walls of the vesicle are uh, coated with uh, these uh, uh, clays and then growing within the vesicle is uh, barium sulfate or barite. 
Uh, we also have macroscopic examples of the uh, bug filling or vesicle filling. Uh, this is, again, two centimeters, so this is a multi-centimeter uh, cavity within the uh, dark colored black impact melt rock uh, near the bottom of the core. This is core 293 uh, of 303 cores, so this is very close to the bottom of the borehole. Uh, and here's a close-up view of that same uh, 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 alteration uh, mineral, and in this case, it turns out to be silica, again, a variety of amethyst. Uh, you can see macroscopically evidence of the hydrothermal alteration through the core. Uh, so you can see that these large swaths, red colored swaths, these are broad channels of the red-orange colored analcene and coexisting with sodium dacheardite. Uh, this is close-up views. Uh, this is uh, simply a, a camera view of that uh, enhanced specimen, and this is a backscattered electron image. Here is the, the host rock. Uh, here is an open fracture into which these uh, minerals are growing. So here is, again, the sodium dacheardite, and there's also some um, uh, pyrite framboids uh, there. Uh, these are all lower temperature assemblages on the order of 200 degrees and possibly uh, less. Um, Analcene, as I said, coexists with the sodium dacheardite, sometimes with hulandite. The parent of dacheardite is still poorly understood, but has been reproduced experimentally at around 250 degrees. Uh, analcene can be produced from albidum water when temperatures cool below uh, 200 degrees. Uh, to show you again that some of these uh, minerals are actually growing into open cavities, fluid-filled open cavities, I have a, a series of uh, SEN uh, views. This is in the melt-bearing polymic breccia. This is an open cavity. Here we have the sodium dacheardite calcite growing into it. Uh, here we have uh, calcite, sodium dacheardite, analcene. And here we have a close-up picture of one of those pyrite framboids swallowed in sodium dacheardite. So all of these are growing into these open fluid-filled uh, cavities at relatively uh, low temperatures. Now, uh, in the title, I suggested that we're going to, be, uh, we're going to evaluate uh, the system for um, its habitability potential. Uh, and I want to say, first of all, that hydrothermal alteration is notoriously heterogeneous, but the inferred high temperatures that we see based on the metasomatism uh, indicate that many areas would be locally sterilized. We're still assessing the potential energy sources for uh, microbiota. The sulfide framboids in several veins, as shown here, which is a low temperature and thus biologically compatible mineral assemblage, implies sulfate reduction was one possible viable uh, energy source. And if uh, the model of Oleg uh, is correct, conditions for thermophilic and hypothermophilic life may have existed in this part of the peak ring of uh, the order of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 uh, years. Now, why is this important? Uh, we're looking at Chicxulub, uh, this borehole, not only to understand the processes that occurred 65 million years ago, but we're using this as a proxy for impact events that may have occurred in the Hadean. Uh, this is a graphic that Simone Marchi uh, made for us when uh, he was a postdoc with Bill Bakke and myself. And basically, the punchline is, you know, circa four billion years ago, uh, the, the surface of the Earth was completely uh, uh, resurfaced by impact cratering events, and hydrothermal systems would have been the rule. Okay, so we've postulated before the impact origin of I hypothesis, which suggests that these types of impact generated hydrothermal systems were crucibles for prebiotic chemistry, a habitat for the early evolution of life, and key to that model is that these systems uh, are long lived uh, and that there were tens of thousands of these systems uh, on the early Earth. So I want to wrap up with a few conclusions, and I'd like to address uh, my conclusions in the form of answers to what were uh, pre-drilling uh, questions. Okay, so first of all, is the peak ring deformed? That is, is it sheared and shattered and thus permeable to fluids? And the answer is yes. Shearing is similar to that inferred from geologic mapping of the Schrodinger Basin on the moon, which Jay Malash uh, introduced to you earlier this afternoon, and qualitatively, the permeability is similar to that modeled uh, by uh, Abramoff and Kring uh, prior to the expedition. The team is still working to quantify the permeability using petrophysics and other techniques, uh, but you saw some hint of what's forthcoming uh, in the work that uh, Gail and Oriel presented uh, just a few moments ago. Okay, number two, is the peak ring hydrothermally altered? And the answer would be yes which confirms the impact-generated system was widespread across the Chicxulub impact basin. 
was the hydrothermal system hot, that is greater than 300 degrees, uh, as uh, implied by uh, the Abramoff model? And the answer is yes, the calcium, sodium, and potassium metasomatism and quartz dissolution that I showed you indicate temperatures of the order 300 to 400 uh, degrees. Was the system long lived? Well, the, steam is, the team is still working on a quantitative measure for the duration of the system using a variety of diffusive and radiometric techniques. However, the high temperatures already documented qualitatively imply a long lived system. When the system cooled, did it host therm thermophilic and hypothermophilic organisms? Well, clearly there was sufficient habitat for organisms. The hydrothermal system created a network and niches perfect for microbial ecosystems, but we're still evaluating potential energy sources. Sulfide framboids suggest that sulfate reduction may be uh, an important one. And moving on, since this is a co-sponsored uh, talk by the planetary uh, division, I also wanted to segue to these two questions. Does the work support the impact origin of life hypothesis? And yes, for all the reasons above. And finally, does this model have broader implications? And I would say yes, that impact cratering is a fundamentally important heat engine in emerging planetary systems. Impact generated hydrothermal systems are possible wherever water exists in a planetary crust, and the model is transferable to an early Mars, has been postulated by many investigators in the past, and any exoplanetary system with similar conditions. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Yes, Jack? Uh, they are everywhere in the core, that is both the high and the low temperature assemblages are throughout the core. Uh, you do definitely see a paragenetic sequence, that is you do see the high temperature mineral assemblages early and they are getting overprinted by the lower temperature uh, mineral assemblages. And that's similar to the pattern that we saw in the Yashkapoil 1 core, although that was a much truncated core. There we only had about 100 meters of impact dites. Uh, that is a question that may get answered by others on the expedition. So I am not going to wade into their waters. Okay, is that? Okay. Yeah. Um, you didn't talk about, you didn't say anything about the pH of the fluids. I think I can guess, but from the mineral assemblages, have you guys sort of backed out estimates for that? No, not yet. It's obviously something that needs to be done. Uh, I mean, we've played around in, in, in a qualitative sense, but we've not tried to put any numbers on that. Um, the, the first order of business was to try to assess the types of mineral assemblages that we have throughout this core. Uh, and I was given 400 samples. I have to admit, we've only been through 68 of them, and that itself was a lot of work. But we'll get there. Okay, we should uh, move on. Our next speaker, thank you, David. Our next speaker is Sonia Tiku, uh, Paleomagnetic Insights into Impact-Related Hydrothermal, sy Hydrothermal Systems and Magnetic Anomalies at the Chicxulub Crater. All right, so last year, Expedition 364 drilled into the peak ring of the Chicxulub impact crater, and we recovered about 700 meters of rock from the peak ring itself. So the upper peak ring, as has been discussed, is primarily made out of impact breccias, melt-bearing breccias, suavites, as well as impact melt rocks. And then we have a lower peak ring sequence, which primarily consists of granitoid basement rocks, which are occasionally cross-cut by both pre-impact as well as impact dikes. But what we see here in these beautiful rock sections are a great record of the physical processes that rocks undergo during an impact event. First of all, we have a lot of heat, enough to melt rocks in many cases. We have shock waves, which are strong enough to deform and fracture rocks. And finally, we also have the post-impact hydrothermal system, which can cause chemical alteration within rocks. And so it turns out that all three of these processes, heat, 
shock, and alteration can affect the remnant magnetization that is preserved in rocks. So today's talk is going to be about what can paleomagnetism tell us about impact cratering features that we see here in the Chicxulub drill core. So uh, the first feature I'm going to talk about today is the hydrothermal system, which we just heard a lot about from David Crane. So the short story here is that there was a pervasive, long-lived hydrothermal system in the crater. And as David mentioned, as it cooled, this hydrothermal system may have been an excellent abode for thermophilic organisms as the system recovered after the impact. But the pressing question is, OK, how long did this hydrothermal system actually exist? So Crane described some models, but we need some experimental ground truth to back up these models. And it turns out that we can use paleomag as a fun tool to actually figure out how long the hydrothermal system lasted. So the way this works is that, as we all know, Earth's magnetic field undergoes reversals every few hundred thousand years. And rocks record the direction of the field at the time that they form, as well as later on, if they get altered, they record the direction of the field at the time of alteration. So right now, the Earth is in a normal polarity regime. So the North Geographic Pole is actually the South Magnetic Pole. And the field has positive inclination. But at the time of the Chicxulub impact, the field was in the opposite polarity. It was reverse polarity, and the field had negative inclination. So you can imagine that after the Chicxulub impact, hydrothermal activity can alter the magnetization in pre-existing rocks. So you can have some original rock with its initial magnetic minerals when it acquired its initial remnants at the time that it formed, whether it's a crystalline basement rock or whether it's a new impact melt rock. It has a primary thermal remnants from the time that it cooled initially. But due to the impact generated hydrothermal system, you have all these chemical laden fluids flowing through the fractures and porosity in the rock. And what that fluid can do is it can either alter existing magnetic minerals or it can destroy them and create new ones. And so finally, you have this final rock, which is still the same rock, but it has new ferromagnetic grains that record possibly a new direction or whatever field there was at the time that the alteration happened. So what we paleomagnetists did was we conducted alternating field demagnetization of rocks from throughout the drill core. So what we have is we have a rock. It's made out of lots of ferromagnetic minerals. Each mineral has its own little magnetization direction in it. And we start by measuring the natural remnant magnetization in the rock. That's what's there before we do any experiments to it. And then we apply alternating magnetic fields to demagnetize the rock progressively. We remove any contaminating overprints that might be present. And we ultimately keep demagnetizing until we reveal this origin trending characteristic magnetization component in the rocks. So that's what we are looking to assess. So whenever we studied the magnetism, particularly in the upper peak ring of the Chicxulub crater, uh, what we found is that most rocks had a single component reversed polarity magnetization. All right, that makes a lot of sense because the field was reversed at the time of the impact. But we also found impactites with normal polarity magnetization. That was interesting. And this is not the first time we've seen this. Jaime saw this back even in 2004 in Yox 1. So if we look at the entire upper peak ring, yeah, most of the rocks have this reverse polarity magnetization, which has the expected field direction at the time of the impact. But we have a lot of samples that have normal polarity. And so it turns out that these normal polarity samples, if you look at the depths, have the same depths that David Crane's group identified secondary titanomagnetite in these rocks. So that's cool. This all makes sense now. Um, and then if we can also confirm the presence of secondary titanomagnetite by looking at magnetic properties like hysteresis loops that assess grain sizes, and we can also look at the Curie temperatures of magnetic grains in the rocks using high temperature magnetic susceptibility. If you want to see a lot more plots like this, you can go check out Jaime's poster later. Um, but in general, we have this confirmed magnetic mineralogy and occurrence here that is hydrothermal in origin. So what does this mean? Well, we know the impact happened, again, during reverse polarity Cron 29R at 66 million years ago. But for there to be normal polarity recorded, that has to be when the field was normal. And the next time the field was normal, according to these uranium lead ages from Clyde et al., you can use whatever reference you want for where the boundary is, 
Um, the next reversal was 65.81 million years ago. So this tells us that the hydrothermal system and the creation of new titanomagnetite lasted for at least 200,000 years, which is a really long time. Um, so that's the hydrothermal system. The next thing that I am going to spend time discussing is the magnetic anomaly that we observe at Chicxulub Crater. So this magnetic anomaly is one of the quintessential features of this crater. In combination with the gravity, it's how we discovered the crater. And what we have is we have a pronounced anomaly where the variations in the field strength at the crater are like an order of magnitude stronger than the background variations in field in the surrounding rocks. So what I'm going to talk about next is how do the new findings of Expedition 364 tell us more about the origin of this pronounced magnetic feature? Well, so prior to Expedition 364, we had sampled a variety of the lithologies that we see now. Again, uh, we had a pretty good understanding of the suavites. We had seen those before and measured their magnetic properties and density and other features, susceptibility. We'd also done that with some impact melt rock compositions. But one thing that was really cool and new about Expedition 364 was we were able to get a lot of samples of this basement and crustal granite, which we had not gotten before in great quantities. So we are able to add to our magnetics data set here. So with this new density, magnetic susceptibility, and remnants information, we can go, move forward and start to construct new magnetic models. So in this plot, I'm going to summarize what we've learned about the natural remnant magnetization of each of these units. So what we find in amps per meter, ampere meter squared per kilogram um, is that we have the granitoids coming in. And they're magnetized reasonably strongly, but out of all of these impact peak ring lithologies, they're actually the most weakly magnetized. An order of magnitude stronger than the granites are the suavites and also some dolerite dikes, which are pre-impact dikes that cross-cut the granite in the lower peak ring. Um, and then finally, an order of magnitude stronger than those are the intensities of magnetization within impact melt rocks. So, here we have a great diversity in magnetization intensity. And one thing that's even more fun is that all of these are orders of magnitude stronger than the intensities of the post-impact carbonates and other sedimentary rocks that are present in the structure. So we also find that the magnetic susceptibility values, which I'm not showing, but they also trend in a similar way in that the impact melt rocks definitely win in terms of being the strongest contributors to the signal. So now that we have all these values, we can move forward and we can try to construct new magnetic models of the crater. So one thing that one of my collaborators from France, uh, Johan Canel at Serej is doing, is he is constructing a new combined gravity and magnetic field model of the Chicxulub crater. It's a work in progress, but using the density measurements that were presented in Morgan et al. 2016, as well as the seismic profiles of the crater that go through the peak ring, um, and also our magnetics and susceptibility information, we were able to construct a forward model of the various lithologic units and their properties that matches what we actually observe over the peak ring pretty well. So the black dots are the actual aeromagnetic and gravity data from the crater, and the black line here is the model, and you can see we have a pretty good fit over the peak ring. We're trying to move forward and extend this to modeling the entire crater. Um, that's a harder job because there's a lot of heterogeneity in physical properties across the crater. The peak ring is not necessarily you know, similar to the rest of the crater in every way, but we're working on it. So in uh, conclusion, I just have two conclusions. Uh, first, the normal polarity magnetization that is present in many zones within the upper peak ring suavites tells us that the Chicxulub hydrothermal system lasted for at least 200,000 years. So we can say that is a long-lived system. The fact that we see normal polarities also in Yoxcapoil 1, which is from a very different region of the crater, tells us this, this is a widespread system, probably a crater-wide system that lasted for quite a long time. And the second conclusion is that We've determined now that the impact melt rocks in the crater are 100 times more magnetic than the granitoid basement, at least at the peak ring. So this tells us that impact melt rocks are a very major contributor
to the overall magnetic anomaly at the crater and probably craters elsewhere in the solar system because if you look at magnetic anomalies on Mars, on the moon, on Mercury, you see that this is where the greatest anomalies also occur is in relation to craters. Thank you. So, any questions? Hey. Yeah, uh, I can tell from your model. So, you have a much thinner melt sheet in the annular trough and then a bigger one in the basin? Yeah, so that's. Um, I, I couldn't tell where. Yeah, okay. You, yeah, it's hard to say which way is which. So, um, I think that the center of the basin is going this way and then the annular chops on the other side. But I mean, it's just, we're plugging in like different thicknesses for layers and this is a flexible model, it's non-unique, but we can, uh, we can talk more about what the expected units and their locations and thicknesses are and refine this. Any other questions, Sonia? Have you seen evidence for like, paleomagnetic reversals in the paleogenes, if you look at the post-impact? Uh, yeah, so we did uh, some magnetostratigraphy work on the post-impact sediments. Uh, that was actually kind of complicated because some of those sediments are not very good magnetic recorders, it turns out. Um, so we have reliable magnetostratigraphy from part of the core, um, but not from the entire core. There's a pervasive normal polarity overprint over much of the core, which we think is a drilling-induced remnants, actually, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, we're working on it and hopefully we have my samples and we also have samples in the two Mexican labs. So hopefully if we combine our data sets, we can tease out a better stratigraphy, but I'm not presenting that here. Any other questions? Um, so we actually have a cancelled talk now. So if anybody would like to ask questions of the previous speakers, I don't think Oriol managed had, had any time for questions. So. Um, anybody want to ask the previous speakers questions? We can invite them. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> we, we take the opportunity to invite uh, to the poster session. Uh, we have a, a, a related session on the uh, Cretaceous uh, uh, Paleogene boundary and the Paleocene Iocene uh, transition, and it's actually now in the poster uh, hall. Uh, and uh, we have uh, more results uh, from the expedition 364. And uh, uh, tomorrow we have the second part of the session, uh, at the same time, uh, the, the poster session, and we have uh, an invited talk, uh, the uh, Frontiers uh, uh, talk uh, by Joe tomorrow at noon in the theater. Yeah, so those sessions, just for uh, information, our PP23B is the one this afternoon happening right now. Uh, and then tomorrow is uh, P what 33D is yes. the poster session tomorrow afternoon. Yes, right. And then the we have the results. Okay. And of course, Joe is giving the Frontiers of Geophysics lecture tomorrow at lunch, which she will not admit to herself. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Do we have any discussion questions? Yeah. Charles. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the question uh, basically boils down to um, a request for a better explanation of the impact origin of life hypothesis. And um, the, the hypothesis goes like this. During the Hadean, based on what um, we have learned about the bombardment of the Earth-Moon system from studies of the Moon, uh, the Earth would have been severely um, bombarded. And what is severely bombarded? Well, aerially you saw in that nice uh, GIF movie that Simone Marchi uh, made. Um, but qu quantitatively, uh, we may have had 200 basins, 1,000 kilometers in diameter. We would have had a few 5,000 kilometer basins. Uh, and some previous calculations by uh, Kevin Zonley and Norm Sleep. You, don't see them in the room. 
Uh, anyway, they had done some calculations that showed those size impact events would completely vaporize the seas or the surface water on the Earth. Uh, and it would take about a thousand years for the water to uh, rain back out of the uh, atmosphere. And so during those periods, that period of bombardment, it would have been um, impossible for life to survive at the surface. Okay, so most mechanisms that um, have the origin of life occurring uh, at the, the surface um, don't seem to be tenable during that epoch. Um, so we have suggested that while those large impact events were terrible for any type of biotic activity that occurred at the surface, those same impact events created these vast subsurface hydrothermal systems and that within those hydrothermal systems, we could have had the prebiotic uh, chemistry that generated RNA that led to the DNA and, and the origin and early evolution uh, of life. So it's, it's the impact created, impact generated hydrothermal systems that we suggest where life, life uh, originated. Um, so how do you test that? Uh, one, one way to test that is to evaluate, uh, better evaluate that bombardment rate and we're doing that. Others are doing that with additional studies from the, uh, of impact lithologies on the moon. The other way you test it is to go to terrestrial impact sites and see if, in fact, there were hydrothermal systems. The answer is yes. Uh, and then the other question is, how long lived were those systems? And that's one of the other factors that we're trying to address. You saw that in both my talk and, and, and Sonia's talk. Um, gentleman asked a very good uh, question about uh, fluid chemistry, and we're going to have to evaluate that. We're going to have to evaluate energy sources, um, but all of those are a series and sequences of tests that we can apply, and, and hopefully we'll be able to apply uh, a lot of those tests to this particular rock. So, is that good? Yep. Yeah, we can uh, add that um, while Charles is not here to give his talk, he does have some results uh, to report on um, cell counts within the crater. So that's active living cell counts, you know, within the suavites that he is uh, actively working on. And there's at least three cases of having extracted DNA. We were all excited to find out what he found, but unfortunately he's not here to tell us. So we'll have to find out at some future meeting. So that's Charles Cockle at University of Edinburgh who's doing that work. Other questions? We have another, oh, nine minutes before we can let Chris Lowry give us the next talk. <laughs> yeah, Connie. Yeah, um, so the question was about other deformation features that you can see, such as in zircon. Um, so as far as I understand, um, granularization of zircon canonically happens at this time, at the same time when fractures are forming, because uh, phase transitions, I think, have been noted to happen after that, and they're sensitive to the to the plateau conditions. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Other questions? Yeah. Okay, so we have a quick break. Um, Chris Larry's talk will start exactly at ten past, so in about eight minutes. Yeah. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh-huh. No, I, I was ignoring him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just being that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I you couldn't really talk to somebody that doesn't have paper. Yeah. No, 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 but now I'll talk to you. Yeah, right now. It's really getting awkward in the Yeah, I know. It's terrible. Who's, who's next after? Oh. It's just, just, it's good to have to. And who's also on the PC? Okay, so we're going to just, just do two PC and PC. Hey, Yes, Hi, how are you? Look here. It's her fault. She made me go to a press conference. What was that? Are you ready for tomorrow? No. Can you give me some hints? What I should say? Yes. Yeah. So perhaps I should write my talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have one anyway. Should I have no, one or just stand up? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, I think the talk of the evening. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's Dan Rather and Joe Morgan. Yes. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're you know, coming, same level. <laughs> I'm coming to the picture of the Well, yeah. And the evening. I had a quick sneak peek, yeah. Tomorrow I'm going. I have to go early and, and they do all the things. We were we waiting for you to come here. You didn't turn up, so we, we just carried on. Okay, no. What we do? <laughs> well, we, uh, we were in the theater uh, for the climate change uh, oh, yeah. conference, and uh, it's uh, about uh, half a mile away. You're it's a long uh, ways. I couldn't believe how far it was to get here. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were yeah. running and uh, no way. <laughs> ah, it's amazing. This is a big building. <laughs> We have four minutes. And do you want to introduce me? Sure. Don't trust me with that. I'll probably turn it off. <laughs> well, so everything's on that side now, so now it's easy. Yeah. Now we just, when he's done, we just load it up. Quite easy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I saw Cozy. Yeah. So, um, Heather Are you done? Because I seem to be at the well, session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think she's just on either side of the PTM. Yeah, but the PTM, you said you will, I mean, my poster. I'm excited to see it. Because we have a take with a course cover, I have a hair solution with volume titanium, and then I have a proxy applied to the tip of the hair. So you can see the hair with volume titanium, and there's a proxy approved. Activity. So you can recognize the PTM, but mainly the echo is the is yeah, better. Yeah, the early yes. Eocene one. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. The Paleocene is probably the high base and the low. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. so that's what, that's what Heather's paper is going to be about. Okay. And so it would be cool maybe we can collaborate on that. Yeah, because it, it is very clear that you can see the carb the viral titanium previous to the Eocene, and the, uh, during the Eocene, all really the things, yes, yes. Totally different. Well, yes, yeah. totally different. That's cool. Yeah, also, also titanium, you, it is very nice because uh, the titanium peaks are very, very nice and, uh, in several uh, thermals. And I recognize, I think, uh, other, uh, not the other, but I don't know, but it's, uh, they are not reported in the individuals. Okay. Wow. Maybe we okay. can we should look. more, yeah. but not not too much about the TDM. I think uh, maybe ETM two, ETM three, or more or eco. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Sweet. So it's, is that on your poster? Yeah. Is that uh, which no. is today, right? Today, yeah. yes. Today, and I will send you the poster if you. Yesterday. Can. No, it's today. Today. Oh, okay. Today. Yes. So yeah. we should start in about another minute. I'll just wait to 309. Yeah.
Okay, okay so um, we're going to go on to, we've got two more presentations in this session, and the first presentation is by Chris Lowry, and he's going to tell us about the recovery of life at the impact site. All right, thank you so much. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, I'm starting a minute early, so I think it's a great opportunity to point out that all the paleo art for the recovery from the mass extinction is all mammals sticking their snouts out and looking at the devastated ecosystem. And I would really like just one piece of artwork that's like a 4 a.m. cautiously floating through the upper water column. I think that'd be really nice <laughs> to diversify our paleo art a little bit. Okay, so uh, obviously it's a very collaborative project. Uh, I'm indebted to the entire science part of it. I particularly want to uh, point out uh, Heather Jones, Tim Braylauer student at Penn State. She did all the nanofossil data that I'll be showing in a minute. So she is uh, integral to this talk. So we're going to talk about the long-term recovery of life in the Chicks Loop crater. And this is interesting for several reasons. Um, it's the only large impact crater on Earth. We have a good record of the recovery of life. It's the only large impact crater on Earth that's associated with a mass extinction event. And so, of course, we've got records of the KPG recovery all over the world. But particularly in the Chicks Loop crater, um, it's a unique environment. And so it's a really good uh, place to, to understand this. And what we find when we look at the recovery in the Chicks Loop crater is life comes back very quickly. Uh, life appears within years, there's a high diversity ecosystem within tens of thousands of years, and long term, um, there doesn't seem to be any crater specific processes that are going on, it looks like just like any other long term Paleocene record, which is really cool and interesting, and if you asked me beforehand if I would have guessed that that's what we'd find, I would have said no. So. That's neat. Okay, so this is a plot of uh, plankton 4 m diversity. This is from a great paper by Andy Frost uh, from a couple years ago. And all the way back here, when uh, plankton 4 minifera evolve, uh, plankton 4 minifera for all your planetary science folks, by the way, stand size uh, plankton that float around in the oceans. They have a hard shell. We can study them. It's good. Um, so plankton 4 m evolve back here in the Jurassic. They increase in diversity all the way through the Cretaceous. And then obviously, the in Cretaceous mass extinction is a huge. Uh, um, drop in this plot. 90% of planktic foraminifera went extinct. 75% uh, of all life on Earth went extinct. That includes non avian dinosaurs, ammonites, mosasaurs, cool things like that. 90% of planktic forams went extinct. Uh, and then we have this long recovery through the Cenozoic. And you can define recovery in several different ways. Think about recovery in terms of diversity, that is the number of species. Or you can think about recovery in terms of productivity of the ecosystem. And those things don't necessarily go hand in hand. And if we think about recovery of, of diversity, as you can see in this plot, uh, within tens of thousands of years after the impact, a uh, couple, uh, you know, more than a dozen new species reappeared. So it's really quick, uh, comes back a bit. Through the rest of the Paleocene, it kind of slowly increases. There's a big jump here at the PETM. Another big jump for the Middle Eocene, that nice climate optimum. Uh, and then another extinction event, the Eocene Oligocene boundary, and we kind of come back up. Um, what's really interesting to me is that uh, even today, in the modern ocean, there are fewer species of planktic foraminifera than there were at the end of the Cretaceous. So if you think about recovery only in terms of number of species, uh, we actually still haven't recovered from the KPG boundary. Um, and, that, I don't, and I think that, that for that reason is not the best um, way to think about recovery of the ecosystem. You have, have a healthy um, um, ecosystem with full functionality that's just composed of fewer species than you had before. Um, so within the, the recovery, there's two kind of big events with the, with the planktic foraminifera, and both of those have to do with how they ate, um, uh, or their, their strategy for finding food. Uh, the first, they develop spines very quickly, some, some um, species of forams, and then a few million years later, some other species uh, started having photosymbionts that lived in their shells with them. So spines were the first new innovation, and they are used to help uh, foraminifera eat. So all foraminifera float around, they have pseudopods, they float around in the ocean, they grab stuff. Uh, forms that don't have spines are grazers, they're herbivores, they eat phytoplankton, they eat pieces of detritus that are floating by, but if they grab onto like a swimmer, like a copepod, um, the copepod's going to kick and spin around and break off and get away. They can't eat those bigger things. But with the spines, the spines provide an anchor for those pseudopods, and when they get a copepod on there, and uh, they can hold onto it and they can eat it. And so they basically increased uh, the number of things in the oceans that you could eat. So this is a nice adaptation if you're living in an environment where there's not a lot of food. Same thing with um, uh, photosymbionts. So here's a nice foram, uh, the modern foram with all the pseudopodia coming off. And there's these little uh, dinoflagellates, or um, diatoms, sorry, uh, living here on the spines, these little photosymbionts. And they live there. And when the foram finishes its life cycle, it pulls those uh, photosymbionts in and it eats them. And then it finishes growing and reproduces. Uh, and so that kind of helps them get over the hump. That's kind of a critical stage of the life cycle, right, to reproduce. Um, and so uh, in, in the modern ocean, these things, uh, characterize uh, um, oligotrophic environments, which are environments that have very low nutrients, very low productivity in the surface waters. So both of these major innovations have to do with food. Um, uh, Spinosphorams uh, came in right, uh, right after the boundary, one of the first diversifications that happened was the development of spines. 
Uh, photosymbionts occurred a couple million years later. I think we draw this phylogeny a little bit differently now. Um, all photosymbiotic forms, uh, common ancestor of Primurica, pseudo and constans right here, so you'd actually scoot this line across and these things are related to. But it came back a couple million years later. Um, so the recovery of productivity in the oceans is heterogeneous. The recovery of diversity in the oceans is also heterogeneous. This is a great compilation from a paper by uh, Shelley Hull and Dick Norris from a couple years ago showing productivity at different KPG boundary sites across the world. Uh, black are places where productivity decreased after the boundary. White are places where it went up. Um, there's kind of broadly a geographic trend to this. Uh, you have slower recovery in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic, somewhat too in the South Atlantic. Um, these Mexican sites, for example, the productivity took 300,000 years to get back to the level that it was at in the Cretaceous. Other places in the Pacific, like Shatsky Rise or Hess Rise, um, product, productivity actually increased after the boundary. Um, so we can look at these plots over here, which is from another paper by Shelley Hall. She's done a lot of really good work on this stuff. Uh, looking at, uh, these are nanofossils, these are phytoplankton. Um, the blue here are um, survivor species that, that survived from the Cretaceous. The yellow are new Paleocene species. This is Shatsky Rise in the Pacific, that high productivity site dominated by survivor species. Not a lot of innovation and diversification there. This is Walvis Ridge in the South Atlantic where productivity didn't really change too much. And right away you get a lot of Paleocene species um, that kind of continue on through. And um, with the Foraminifera, the red here are microperforates. Those are the survivors and the new things, the, 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 the disaster fauna. And those are common at both, both cases early on and slowly decline up section. Um, kind of unrelated to the recovery of diversity of the, uh, the nanofossils. So I think that, that, that productivity, again, is a probably a better um, measuring stick for actual recovery in the oceans than, than diversity. So we can look at the Chicxulub crater here in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's, there's this whole apparently geographic trend, um, slow recovery closer to the crater, slow recovery productivity. We can look in the crater itself and kind of test this hypothesis. You'd expect that if there's any sort of slower recover, slow recovery related to distance from the crater, that you would obviously see that effect within the crater. So that's what we did. So here again is our site on the peak ring. And um, what we're going to do now, oh, I also want to point out the, the northeastern area of the crater kind of got blown out, so there's a good kind of deep connection to the Gulf of Mexico to let this uh, open marine water come in. Water came right back into the crater minutes after the impact. <clears throat> so we have a, ha a possible habitat for stuff right away. So what we're going to do is, is look at the Paleocene section of the core, uh, start out zoomed in right on the very base of the, the post-impact sediments, and kind of step back slowly and look at... Um, the initial recovery of life in the first couple hundred thousand years and the first couple million years uh, to see how things happen. So um, what we have here, uh, we actually we haven't, I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen a lot of core yet in this talk. We have this is the, uh, the top of the post of uh, the impact breccia. And we have this 80 centimeter brown transitional unit. This is a fine grained micrite. And then we have this nice fine grained uh, white limestone uh, right above that. The very base of that white limestone contains Parvula rugoglobigerina eugabina. This is the first new spe one of the first new species to evolve in the Paleocene. It marks the base of a 4AM zone that's, that starts about 30,000 years after the impact. So we're pretty confident that right here, that, that almost exactly the base of this limestone is 30,000 years after the boundary. Um, what we are very interested in is, is how long the rest of this takes. Um, how this, if obviously this, this impact breccia is hours after the boundary, but the, uh, um, the, the transitional unit here um, we have a di couple different proxies for this. We have helium isotopes, which is it suggested it was, it was deposited uh, below the resolution of the helium isotope proxy, which is on the order of hundreds, hundreds of years. And then, of course, we have an enrichment of platinum group elements right here at the top with iridium, which uh, would have been the fallout layer from the impact, which would have occurred years after the boundary. So this whole thing is, is probably deposited within a couple years after the impact. And within this unit, we find evidence for life, which is really surprising and very exciting. The best evidence for life, life that we have is bioturbation. This is really great. Bioturbation can't be reworked from the Cretaceous, right? It's a primary sedimentary feature. And starting up here towards the top of the unit, we start to see these burrows, plant plantolites and chondrites burrows, discrete. Uh, not a lot of them, but they're there. We're also confident that these aren't coming down from above from the limestone because you can see they're infilled with the same brown material um, that the rest of this transitional unit is made out of. And these, there's a, a few closer to the top that uh, are actually infilled with the white limestone from above. So that's uh, a good example of how we're confident that these things are actually um, deposited during the, the deposition of the transitional unit itself. We also find um, microfossil evidence for life uh, in this transitional unit. So this is um, 
formative for per gram of uh, sediment down here at the base. Tons and tons of forams, more than 2,000 forams per gram, and that drops off pretty quickly. And we bounce around between uh, 10 and 100 the rest of the way up. These lower samples are dominated by almost entirely by Cretaceous uh, species that have been reworked. But as we go up section, we see an increase in the percentage of survivor foraminifera um, as we work our way up. And especially in this section, we see more and more Gwimbalitria cretacea. This is a species that in the Cretaceous only dominated marginal marine coastal waters. Uh, and we know from the reworked assemblage down here at the base that the, that the, the mastricting assemblage of this site was all open marine, uh, the kind of thing you would not expect to see Gwimbalitria cretacea in. And so what we, we expect that these are actually survivors that are starting to migrate out into the deeper waters. Uh, they dominated the first couple, like, tens of thousands of years of the Cretaceous in the open ocean. See the same thing with micro or with uh, nanofossils, phytoplankton. Uh, these are as a percentage of micula. These are way smaller than you ever see in the Cretaceous. These are smaller than two microns, and you see they increase subsection. Also, the nanofossil assemblage. Um, you see uh, uh, the blue here are kind of typical Mastrichtian sites. The red is Chicxulub. We have way more reticapsula than is normal. We also have way more Watsonaria than normal. We have way fewer of other species that are usually common components of, of Mastrichtian op open ocean assemblages. This is not a a reworked assemblage that has the proportions you'd expect to see for a re reworked assemblage. We think these are, these are the ones that we see here are survivors. Uh, so we think we have really strong evidence for life within years. Uh, zooming out a little bit, this is the, the limestone directly above that brown transitional unit. This represents about 150 or 200,000 years, this part that we're looking at right here. Uh, this contains a high productivity assemblage. There's blooms of calcareous nanoplankton. Uh, we see high bi barium titanium, barium iron ratios, biogenic barium is a good uh, proxy for productivity in the open ocean. We also see relatively high abundance of benthic foraminifera and a high diversity of benthic foraminifera with a lot of epifaunal and infaunal forms throughout this section. So the, the lowermost um, uh, uh, limestone here within 30,000 years of the boundary uh, is um, characterized by high productivity uh, ecosystem. And if you remember, like in the, uh, the rest of the Gulf of Mexico sites, it, productivity took about 300,000 years to come back. So life is re or productivity uh, is, is increasing in the crater an order of magnitude sooner than you see right around the rest of the Gulf. So there's really no um, geographic trend there. Uh, longer term, so this is now about 2 million years after the boundary, we have um, uh, blooms of, of calcareous nanoplankton. So this is all high productivity assemblages down here. When that kind of declines, we have these boom-bust cycles, which are pretty common across the North Atlantic recovery interval. And we can step back a little bit further and look at some benthic, or some foram trends and kind of see the, the whole picture here come together. So we have, um, this is about four million years after the impact. We have benthic foraminifera, which are sensitive to the amount of organic matter that's coming down to the seafloor. Then we have uh, microperforate foraminifera. These are the things without spines. These are the first, um, um, uh, you know, the, kind of the disaster assemblage. These are, these are the herbivores. They're going to be eating the, the phytoplankton, but they can't, they don't do well in, in lower productivity environments. Here's spinose foraminifera, which can eat more things. And finally, symbiont bearing or, uh, foraminifera, which appear up here and are kind of abundant the rest of the way up the section. So uh, at the very base of the section, we, we get it, we have that high productivity interval. Uh, but within that high productivity interval, we have a couple peaks in productivity, one of which is at the very base. Um, and then there's a bit of a decline where you get more spinose forms and fewer benthics. Uh, and then another peak um, with more benthics and, and fewer spinose forms and then another drop. And then kind of a broad uh, high productivity interval as you go through um, uh, the first million years or so of the Paleogene. And then we start to decline and you can see this drop in microperforates and this slow increase in, uh, in spinose forms. At the same level, we start to see this general decrease in um, uh, the bloom taxa from the phytoplankton that, uh, that Heather's counted. Uh, and that kind of continues on up through the rest of the section where we have this lower productivity, more uh, oligotrophic uh, interval towards the top. So um, to kind of pull it all together and summarize, life appeared within the crater very quickly. Um, we have high productivity within about 30,000 years. That's an order of magnitude faster than other Gulf of Mexico sites. So there's no geographic trend related to distance from the crater uh, that's, that's controlling uh, the recovery of life. Um, the, what, the recovery that we see really isn't unique to the crater. It's kind of similar to other trends uh, around the rest of the world. Um, there are several pro pulses of high productivity that occur in the earliest part of the recovery before we have a general decline in productivity through the rest of the Paleocene. Um, and the question, of course, that remains is what's causing that? Is it climate or oceanography locally? Maybe the hydrothermal system is providing nutrients for a while, and as the hydrothermal system cools off, uh, 
you lose that source of nutrients and productivity declines. Is there some ecological internal component to this? And that's what we want to investigate next. So thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one question. Uh, they would have come in from uh, open ocean Gulf of Mexico. This, that's where this, um, this kind of deep water connection is important. Uh, everything right where the asteroid hit basically would have been vaporized. Um, so yeah, you're getting stuff that's coming in from nearby, but the crater itself actually would have been sterile, uh, at least initially until the water rushed back in a few minutes later. So um, yeah, that's one of the cool things about this is the first record of primary succession in a large impact crater. So. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to our final talk of the session. Um, it's going to be given by Katie Grice, and um, she's going to be talking about biomarkers and the stable isotopes in Cenozoic sediments above the Chicxulub impact crater. Okay. Thanks, Sir uh, Joanne. Um, yeah, today I'm going to present about biomarkers. Um, in sediments and of the Cenozoic and the breccia in the Chicxulub impact crater from the IODP ICDB Expedition 364. This is work um, um, mainly done by Bettina Schaefer, PhD student at Curtin University, and collaboration with Roger Summons, Michael Coolan, and the Expedition 364 scientists. So um, we all know there's five extinction events and most of these are associated with massive volcanism except the end or division. Um, the end Cretaceous one we know is the only one related to a meteorite impact. 75% um, of plant and animal species was extinct including dinosaurs, reptiles, ammonites and rudists and plankton from nifera, calcareous nanofossils and land plants were significantly affected. So this is the world to uh, 65 million years ago, very much like today. Um, the only difference being that there's no polar ice caps and probably a very warm climate at that time. And then we had the impact, <laughs> which led to um, the discovery of the peak ring by this team, uh, Joanne Morgan and uh, Sean Gulick, and the 364 expeditionists. Um, this uh, led to uh, a Earthquake, um, ten, of a greater 10 on the Richter scale, tsunamis, wildfires, um, and a arrhythmic anomaly and an impact winter. So the Chicxulub impact crater was drilled in 2016 as part of the 364 expedition. Uh, Michael Coolan um, was the Australian science team uh, member on that cruise, and they drilled. Um, very well, uh, the Chicxulub crater um, off the Yucatan Peninsula for geomicrobiology biology and organic geochemistry. So this is the core. Um, we have, um, going from the basement granitic rock, you've heard a lot about these uh, sediments and rocks today, the impact melt uh, bearing breccia and the post-impact sediment um, here. And then today I'll talk about samples from the Paleogene and some of the samples from this wave eight, um, which has been referred to as well. So to show um, this, uh, just to show you that organic matter was extracted, the TOC varies from about 0.5 to 4% through section. Um, the SUVE sample is uh, here, which I'll refer to. Um, then we have uh, samples associated with the uh, PETM, and then samples like this um, from the Cenozoic above the PETM. So these are just representative samples which I'll show. So basically the um, alkanes and styrenes, um, <coughs> this is the plot of the percentage of styrenes, uh, C27, C28 and C29. Uh, we see that in the lower section, going from the PETM upwards, there's a dominance of land plant waxes and high C29 sterines coming from C29 sterols of plants. 
together with um, evidence of dinosteranes and dinoflagellates. Lamplight waxes are actually absent in the upper part of the section. Um, uh, however, C27 and C29 steranes coming from cholesterol and uh, C29 sterol uh, suggest algal dominance, plus we have dinosteranes coming from dinoflagellates. So quite a bit of variation in terms of um, some of the other important features. These samples is um, shown here from the saturated fractions uh, from the uh, three representative samples. In the lower sample, we have um, alkanes and squalane. Um, the samples from the PETM characterised by uh, isoprenoids, pristane, phytane with a relatively low um, ratio, which geochemists interpret as anoxic conditions. And the um, samples from the upper part of the Cenozoic um, also low pristine phytane ratios. Um, and just note the UCM here, because I'll show you how we actually deconvoluted that in a moment. Um, we also found um, very high abundances of sulfurized, highly branched isoprenoids and hoponoids, so the sulfur within, within the molecule. Um, the HBIs coming from diatoms, and these sulfurized compounds supporting early diagenetic sulfurization occurring in the water column uh, through H2S sequestration. Low pristine phytane anoxia, likely for tixonusenia, which I'll come back to for the PETM and above. And um, this Suefe example is characterized largely by bacteria and archaea, um, which is, could be attributed to a soil. Um, looking into the UCM of these samples, this is two-dimensional GCGC analysis, where we can actually see what is behind the UCM. Um, and it, just to show you the range of compounds, we have alkanes, steranes and steranes and dinosteranes, um, hopanes and uh, long chain uh, alcohol fifenes with sulfur. Again, high amounts of sulfurized compounds. Um, we also identified um, by using 2D GC MS analysis, um, olinane and lupane occurring uh, within actually the suivite sample and upwards through all the samples. Uh, these are derived from angiosperms and uh, these components can only be separated by this technique, but this supports uh, the rapid rise of the angiosperms um, occurring uh, in the suvite and above. In the aromatic fractions for the suvite, suvite sample, we find um, high amounts of arom polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, coronine and perylene, but no, perylene is significantly abundant. Um, again, in the PETM samples, a quite different distribution in the Cenozoic samples above the PETM. These pHs are attributed largely to wildfires or hydrothermal um, sources, which is consistent with the uh, previous talk today. Um, the pH perylene, however, um, has being shown to be associated with fungal um, degradation, so it's from a pigment made by fungi which degrades wood in situ in sediments. Um, and just to show you that perylene, this is some uh, earlier work where perylene has um, only been shown to occur um, in samples which are older, um, younger than the Devonian, um, both sediments and oils, and the delta D composition of perylene in uh, very recent samples um, supports a source from fungi which actually use wood <coughs> as a source of, um, of, of food and uh, therefore the delta D composition is consistent with the delta D composition of lignin in wood. Um, moving to the second part of the results, I just wanted to introduce you to the habitat of photosynthetic sulfur bacteria, which are um, indicative of photoxonusinic conditions and stratification conditions that occur in the modern-day Black Sea. Um, we have uh, here um, 
a stratified water body, hydrogen sulfide is high at the chemocline where there's low oxygen levels and purple, green and green brown sulfur bacteria can quite happily live here, um, utilising H2S as an electron donor in photosynthesis and capture it in longer wavelengths of light. The H2S is provided to them by the sulfate reducing bacteria in the sediments or the sediment water interface that anaerobically degrade organic matter. These organisms, um, to capture this longer wavelength of light, have to make very specific pigments and carotenoids. Um, the purple sulfur bacteria, which is able to live in the presence of oxygen, the only one, makes ochinon. The green um, sulfur bacteria make chlorobactine, and the green brown sulfur bacteria make the carotenoid isorinoretin. So, um, biomarkers which are indicative of these have been reported previously. So, ochinon gives ochinane. Um, chlorobactine, chlorobactane, and isorinoretine gives rise to isorinoretine. So in us, um, these have been previously reported um, in the um, Zestein uh, copper shell of Germany, early Permian, 1.6 billion year old lead zinc silver deposits of the Northern Territory in Australia, and have been associated with three major mass extinction events, the ones I mentioned at the beginning, the Permian-Triassic, Devonian, triassic jurassic And here we're talking about the um, end Cretaceous. So do we find these markers? Yes, we do. We find um, uh, Isorina retaining all the samples. Um, however, in the uh, PETM, we find chlorobactane and Isorina retain, indicating Fortixone eusinia and green-brown sulfur bacteria. And in the Cenozoic samples of above the PETM, we find evidence of green, brown, and purple sulfur bacteria, indicating photoxone eosinic conditions. What is unusual is the presence of isorina retain in um, the suavite sample, which has the high amount of perylene and also high amounts of um, soil bacteria. Um, interestingly, uh, asyntomyces. Um, Soil bacteria actually make isorina retain in significant amounts, and this is associated with fungi, which is kind of consistent with the presence of um, our perylene and our wood, and the as the presence of isorina retain in this wave eight sample. So, um, moving to the last slide, uh, we have done some genomics. This is the work of Marco Coolen. Um, this has been uh, where he's extracted DNA. From these samples, this is not um, DNA from 65 million years ago. This is DNA which is um, from the organisms which have entered the cracks in the uh, retra and um, those samples which have got the cracks in which were re previously discussed in the other talks. Um, but there is evidence of DNA in these samples of archaea, eukaryotes and bacteria, but these need to be sequenced. So, in a very quick summary, um, this is the first biomarker and DNA data obtained for the impact crater core, ALDP364. We've got strong evidence of combustion markers, PAHs, and perylene in most samples. Abundant perylene um, in the suvate layer, or suvate layer um, and is indicative perhaps of a, uh, maybe these together a tsunami markers. Um, the recovery of life was probably almost instantaneous with the prolific rise of the angiosperms and also dinoflagellates, which are also identified in some of the deeper layers, the suave and beneath that. There's a dominance of land input from the KPG up to 10 million years above the PETM and there's a dominance of marine import in the overlying sediments of the Cenozoic. High amounts of diatoms in the PETM and above, and Fordixionusenia is uh, prevalent throughout, with the exception of the Swivate, where we believe that Isorina retain in that case is from soil bacteria. Um, there's strong evidence of early diagenetic sulfurization based on the abundance of organosulfur compounds, and sulfurized HBIs and hoponoids. So there's quite a lot of work um, going on and continuing sequencing of the DNA um, 
desulfurisation of the polars, which has revealed that there is a lot of organic material which has been sequestered by H2S in the water column, quantification, porphyrin analysis, malamides, which are breakdown products of porphyrins, and compound-specific isotopes of biomarkers, including delta-34S of organosulfur compounds, which is a really great tool to distinguish TSR and BSR in these samples. So I'd just like to thank Sean and Joanne for giving me the opportunity to present this data and um, for you for listening to me and uh, also the various funding sources. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? In the back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think sometimes biomarkers and um, palynology and um, paleontological means of looking for fossils it sometimes doesn't work together, but they can <laughs> complement each other. Um, so sometimes we find fossils, but we don't find biomarkers, and other times we find biomarkers, but not the fossil remains. So I think that's the beauty of th this integrated approach, is to combine those two uh, tools, so that, yeah. David, you had yeah. David, you had a quick question? Uh, yeah. Um, in two or three places, you indicated you had molecular signatures organisms that grow in soils. Yes. For clarification, are you saying that you think that the peak ring there was subterially exposed? No, no. Or was bring in? I think that I, the, the, the samples is uh, suve or su suave? Suave. Suave, sorry. <laughs> Um, it's where um, th that's like a tsunami, um, so it's been transported in some sense that the perylene and the isoren are retained in those cases, and the angiosperm material has been brought in to the system. So it's a trans, it's an indicator of transport. Okay. All right. Well, we'll uh, any more questions? No. Okay. Then let's. We're going to close out the session. Thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank our three invited speakers, Jay Malosh, Gil Christensen, and David Kring. Um, we have uh, three other Chicxulub sessions here at AGU. So um, going on right now is a poster session PP23B. Please go see that in the paleo section. Tomorrow morning is an oral session PP31D. And then tomorrow afternoon is a poster session that is the second half of this particular planetary session in P33D. So we invite you to all three of those, and thank you for coming. Okay, let's go see posters.